welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And we've got a couple folks uh, still joining as we get started. Um, we are uh, doing our Boston GA release webinar. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. All right, do a quick uh, sanity check. Is uh, every uh, everything coming through? Can everyone see uh, video, hear my audio? Looks good to me. All right, excellent. <clears throat> um, all right, well, uh, yes, uh, we are at that time. Uh, Squid Boston, um, this uh, latest major release is GA. It's live, it's available. And um, we wanted to take some time to go over some of the, the really cool features that are in this release, um, some use cases. And uh, we've got a good crew today uh, for this. We've got uh, Jackson Alexander, our Senior Director of Product Experience here at Squid. Um, and I uh, work with him a lot. This is uh, the, the product team. And then Rob Hatch and I are product managers for, um, for Squid, for Salesforce. And, uh, and then we've got Michael Barnes uh, from the Golf Channel um, here with us today. Uh, and uh, he's going to be jumping in at a couple of different points, uh, talking about some use cases, uh, some of the cool new things that you can do uh, with these features. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and, uh, and jump in. I want to talk about some of the themes uh, for this release. We've got kind of three core themes and then uh, a meta theme that uh, pops up in each one of those uh, that is going to come up as we go. So uh, first big thing that comes through is uh, ongoing design flexibility. Design is in SQUID's DNA. Uh, you know, SQUID, you may not know it, it's an acronym. It stands for Scalable Kit for User Interface Design. We're all about design first. And so every release is going to have more features on the design front with the Design System Studio, and, uh, and this release uh, especially has a lot on that front. Uh, so a lot of these things that help you get to that pixel perfect design um, that you have in mind for your app. Declarative efficiency. Um, so uh, from the get-go, Squid has always been about uh, low code and no code development, uh, helping uh, citizen developers uh, and admins be able to go build really, really powerful apps, but then also um, saving time for code savvy developers um, and letting you just do a ton point and click drag and drop we are uh, we have a ton of controls uh, that boost that declarative efficiency in this release that we're going to get into um, builder usability uh, so this is the tools in the toolbox for the squid builder um, and uh, if you've been in squid for a while I know we've got a number of really experienced builders on uh, the webinar today um, then uh, I think you're going to enjoy some of these features that are a little bit more behind the scenes. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty cool. And, um, and then, yeah, there's this meta theme that pops up with each one of those is extensibility. So in past versions of squid, we have, uh, we've had uh, options for JavaScript, HTML, CSS. And in this latest version of squid that we've had for um, past a year or two, um, we have been working toward uh, releasing more extensibility features. We know that's something that is important. You want to know that you have that option. And uh, there are some pretty cool things um, that we have to show when it comes to extensibility. So those are some of the, the, the themes of this release. And uh, what we're going to do today is spend some time on each one of those. Um, and then uh, we'll, do, we'll do some slides. We've got a demo for each. And then at the end, I do want to open it up for uh, some Q&A. Um, so we've got, again, a number of folks on the call. We'll be monitoring the chat uh, as questions, and we'll, we'll try to answer as best we can. All right, so let's jump in. And for this first uh, section, I want to uh, have Jackson join us. Uh, Jackson is our uh, Senior Director of Product Experience. And before we get into this, I want to have a quick refresher. Uh, because Squid, uh, if, you're a, if you're an admin, if you're a developer in, in the business software world, chances are you are thinking in a functionality first mindset. I know I regularly do. It's, it's kind of the default mode. And Squid might be a little bit of a paradigm shift because we talk a lot about design. 
and we have uh, something called the Design System Studio. So, Jackson, could you give us a quick refresher on the Design System Studio, Design Systems, why is that important? What are we thinking about uh, when, we, when we talk about that? Yeah, thanks, Matt. <clears throat> as, uh, as Matt mentioned previously, Squid basically from the beginning um, has been a design system. Uh, you had a themed set of components. Scalable kit for user interface design is literally another way to refer to a design system or a component library. And the power of Squid has been being able to declaratively combine that with easy ways to get to the data you need and interact with it. So in many ways, design systems and the design system studio are just a continuation <clears throat> and an expansion on that theme. Um, with uh, uh, Spark release and Squid API version two, we introduced the Ink design system, and with it, the Design System Studio, which is, um, if you're not already familiar, which is kind of the, the newest uh, iteration and version of what was previously the theme editor. Um, the number one, uh, or one of the number one differences that we introduced with that is the concept of variants, style variants. Whereas previously, if you needed um, anything beyond the base components, like something other than a primary or a secondary button, you are going to custom CSS to style that or create that. With the Design System Studio, yeah. you can create as many style variants as you need declaratively. Um, and so we introduced that a while back with Spark Update 3 in the spring. We introduced the concept of child variants and the option to clone variants, which makes that even easier. Uh, and then we've continued down that path with the Boston release. And we're going to walk through uh, a few things that, uh, that kind of show what we've got and where it's going. Cool. Yeah. And uh, I, I just want to stress for someone like me who doesn't come from a background as a developer, um, the theme composer was awesome, but I, whenever I wanted those exceptions to rules for styling rules, I ended up spending half a day trying to figure out how to target the right element to get that CSS in there. So that ability to create those style variants declaratively, and, and when we talk about scalable, that's a big part of it, where you have this, this component library of styles, and every time someone goes and builds a page, you know that they're going to get the right style button and you're going to have that consistent, um, you know, approach across, which is hugely important for things like communities and portals. Uh, but it's also deceptively important for back office applications as well. Um, really important when you have a cons consistent experience, it's a lot more readable. It's easier for your users uh, to go use your apps. They spend less time searching for things. So there are a lot of, um, trickle down effects of having a good consistent design. So this, this release has a number of features that make that even easier. Um, Jackson, you want to talk us through uh, some of these things? Yeah, do you want to go ahead and I think you could uh, progress this. There we go. Yeah, uh, dynamic spacing. So if you're not familiar with rim units, uh, we've added the option to do spacing uh, in your design system with rim units. Previously, it was pixel-based, and that option still exists. Um, the great thing about it is uh, rim is wonderful for supporting responsive design, for uh, naturally resizing spacing and text with the browser. Um, so whether you're at widescreen desktop or all the way down to a mobile view of your application. You can now set rim spacing uh, as for the base values in your application or in your design system. If you want um, everything to resize um, in accordance with, uh, with the browser size, but you can also set custom spacing units that can be rim or pixel based. So you can mix and match where you need to, to say, I want this to always be the same size but for example, I want the content of my big table, I want the spacing and text to reduce with the screen because we know tables can be a little uh, unwieldy on small screens. Mm -hmm. um, with other features like you know, conditional rendering or conditional styling, there are other things you can do, obviously, in response to a mobile view. But um, one of the really cool things that having rim or dynamic spacing that uh, will allow you to do is give end users control 
over data density on the screen. Uh, what I mean by that is you may be familiar with settings in uh, Google Calendar and Gmail of like compact, cozy, comfortable. Um, you have some folks that are like, I want 80 rows on the screen and that's how I'm used to work and I need to see all that data and uh, some that may not want it that way. So with dynamic spacing, you could actually uh, set like a declarative button set uh, in the runtime that would allow a user to switch between those views and it would resize the spacing and text accordingly, give you more data density on the screen. So, um, yeah. I want to out too here uh, because it's a pretty big change. The way that we talk about our spacing in the Design System Studio, you have a base value and then everything else is a calculation off of that, which means if you are getting a bunch of requests from folks that say, hey, you know what? This isn't readable. We need, it needs to be more breathable just across the board. Or every one of our pages, we wish we had a little bit more density. There's too much white space. You can go and change your base value, which is gonna bring everything down a little bit. So the point is, is that you can manage these things across your whole design system um, because of how that works. So that's a pretty big change, that idea of base values and then your spacing increments being a calculation on top of that. And then you can also have custom spacing as well that's hard-coded, and you can add other increments on top. So a lot of control around how you uh, manage, you know, the readability, how much white space there is across your app there. Yep, and each of those spacing variables are, of course, you know, selectable throughout your design system. So again, you get the control to pick and choose if you want to use a rem unit or you need a pixel unit, wherever. So. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll keep us moving. Yeah, so we've got a bunch of other things going on here. What, what else is, is happening in the DSS? Yeah, so some of these things, uh, some would consider small, except uh, one of the things we know is like, uh, like buttons, for example, they're really important. It's a super important component. So we continue to add more uh, properties for declarative flexibility, design flexibility to, um, especially to the most common we used components and use cases. Um, a few examples here that we're looking at as um, we've had tabs, tab sets um, that have allow for icons and text, but some of the spacing um, uh, between the icons and the text, the width of the tabs, a few other things, we didn't have declarative properties in the D, in the Design System Studio, the DSS. You'll hear us refer to it, um, and and we've added those. So uh, I think you'll probably see some of that in the demo. We've added some additional properties there just to give more control uh, of the spacing there. Um, gradient support for buttons. Um, you know, everything went flat design a little while back and gradients and textures and lots of things have, have come back. And uh, you know, we have customers whose design systems, whose brand design calls for gradients, not just in backgrounds, but sometimes in buttons. So we've added gradient support. Um, and then, uh, you know, additional text styling options, which you'll see come into play um, a little later uh, with the demo and in another section. This is the challenge, right, of going to Clarita first is, is uh, we, we want to give you a ton of options, but we're talking about recreating CSS declaratively, which is yeah. a huge a task. And so that's one of the reasons why Every release, you're going to see more properties in the Design System Studio to really help you get over that finish line with those um, those designs that you're working from, without having to have this massive CSS style sheet. So, a lot, a lot of properties. Every release, there's going to be more, but some really cool ones here that are highly visual and part of every single design um, that you work with. All right, this is a pretty big one. What's <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Matt mentioned sort of the meta theme of extensibility. And uh, we were just talking about adding additional small properties declaratively throughout uh, the Design System Studio. We're gonna continue down that path, right? The most common, most needed properties that aren't there declaratively, we're gonna continue adding those into the Design System Studio uh, as needed. But uh, there are almost always cases where that's not enough, where you can't cover quite everything you need. Uh, what we've done with the Boston release is introduced CSS uh, extensibility for your design system. 
Um, we have uh, a built-in editor. Uh, you can select any variant in your design system and select extend with code. It's going to bring up the code editor um, in context. Uh, it's going to show you the boilerplate code that the, uh, <clears throat> or the component code that already exists and give you a window uh, to add custom properties uh, while still giving you access to the declarative properties pane. So you can adjust properties um, in your declarative properties pane, see how that changes things, combine that with the custom code that you're writing and see the results uh, in the preview area up above. Uh, that allows for some really fun things like CSS transitions, CSS animations. Um, there's lots of CSS properties, especially in the modern web, um, as the CSS spec has grown and continues to grow. Um, and one way that we can give everyone uh, the flexibility they need to achieve the design and functionality they want uh, is to give the option to extend. So very excited about that part of the Boston release. Yeah, and, and um, specifically, I want to point one thing out here. When you go and you extend with CSS, over on the right, you still have access to those declarative properties as well. And that's really what we're trying to do here. We really want you to do as much as you can declaratively, and then you, you can extend, extend when you need to. Well, let me show you some of this uh, in the DSS. Um, I've got one pulled up here. And um, I do want to show the, the spacing aspect. Okay, so this is our dynamic spacing. Um, we'll go ahead and zoom in. That might be a little small for some folks. Uh, you can see our base value is in pixels. Uh, I can change our base value to REM if I want to go to a REM-based design system. I know for some of our solutions engineers, uh, this comes up as a requirement, um, especially for more kind of front-facing community uh, public site type, type um, experiences. Uh, so I can go change it to REM. One is probably better than eight there, but you can see all of the calculations there the increments that are based on my base unit. And I can change my labels for those. I can change my multipliers for those uh, in terms of what those are. I can add my own custom um, multipliers for that. And so I'm, again, I'm setting up the building blocks that any builder is then gonna be able to go and use um, when they go to find spacing at the page level in the, um, in the composer. Um, and then, yeah, let's go look at that, uh, that cool new feature um, extending with, uh, with CSS using the, the JSS editor here. We'll look at a checkbox. Yeah, this is an example of kinetic design. That's one that you see where there's movement. Um, and it's, it seems cosmetic, but it's actually really helpful. Getting that feedback, this is one really simple one, having a bouncy checkbox, okay? There are subtle things for me as a user that happen when I see that happen. Uh, lets me know, yes, that's going through. And you can also see when you edit something using our JSS editor, um, it is going to give you that uh, little icon there that lets you know. So this helps with, with managing your design system going forward. When stuff, when you have to go back, you can go look and see, oh, hey, I actually extended that with code. I've got something going on there. And then I can go pull up the editor and see what it is that I've added specifically to that element. Um, and this is a recurring theme with extensibility. We want you to use code only exactly where you need it. So instead of having to go rebuild the whole thing from scratch, uh, you can do, you know, 95% of it declaratively and then go do exactly what you need um, with code there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and keep us moving. By the way, if folks have questions, we're hoping for having a little time for Q&A at the end. I'm monitoring the chat um, and we'll pick up a couple of questions as we have time for at the end. So if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll either respond during the Q&A session or follow up after the webinar uh, with answers to questions from uh, folks who are in attendance. Cool. All right, yeah, let's, uh, let's keep it moving here. Um, I'm a big talker uh, and I'll do my best to, I don't have uh, the time turkey that we used to have on the Nautilus nuts. Um, so uh, I'll do my best to be my own time turkey. Okay, so the, the second theme, declarative efficiency. 
you know, your point and click drag and drop tools in Squid, it's, it's where you're spending a ton of your time. We want to give you even more uh, control there, uh, specifically for probably 80% of your Squid work, which is related to forms and tables. Um, and so uh, you're spending a ton of time there because that's where data entry, where data display is happening. And there are a lot of features related to those. Those are the nuts and bolts of your Squid app. So the first thing, table row height. We give you some controls on how you're going to manage that. Um, you can see a couple examples here. You can give it a max height, but also have it expand to fit some content. Um, there are reasons why that's not a great experience, but for business software, a lot of the time you want to get that email subject in line and that's possible and you can manage that. And then there's some, some scroll behavior as well. Required fields and unsaved changes. Okay. This is one where um, you know, if you talk with Chris Stern, one of our pre-sales engineers, he'll get these amazing designs um, from uh, Turner and uh, when other designers at, at Squid, and they might have something like this, uh, where it's a badge that lets you know that it's required, or you might have it in all caps. Being able to customize that at the design system level, so that across your app, um, you have your definition for what a required field looks like. That's here in this release. Um, and specifically, uh, asterisk, that's, that's how uh, Salesforce Lightning handles it. So if you've got an app in Lightning and you want to have that consistency there, that's important. Unsaved changes. Squid API v1 had a default style, which you could change uh, with CSS. Um, and then uh, that's something that's been missing for a little while. That's now here. But it's not just a default style. You have the ability to customize that with all of our text styles at the design system level. So if you want to say, I want a background color, I want to have uh, some text decoration. And that text decoration is really important uh, if you're thinking about accessibility. Uh, that came up with, uh, with REM styling for different sighted individuals, being able to scale up the size of the text in your app. Uh, but then uh, for folks that uh, have a hard time seeing um, color, uh, then having text decoration is really important to let them know, hey, yes, changes were made. Um, and uh, if you're using light shades like this, that's even more important. So a lot of controls over what unsaved changes look like when there's a new row or something has been changed to a field. You can now manage that at the design system level. All right, this is one that I'm so excited about. Um, uh, for my years as a solutions engineer, this is something that always took code. Uh, and it's that ability to do uh, field variants. I want to do conditional highlighting, letting the user know that something needs attention. Really common use case for JavaScript over the years. You can see it on the community a lot. Um, there's a new a component in the Design System Studio called Field, where you can go define your field styles across your app, and then you can create variants of that field style um, and use it in different scenarios. Here, what we're doing is we've got a couple of different highlights that we can apply um, that also have some text styles as well. So being able to highlight a missed deadline, whether or not you need a value in here, managing data quality, uh, acceptable range validation between a certain set of numbers. So all kinds of, of use cases there. That is pretty huge. That's one of those uh, small things that, is, um, that has a lot of implications there. So really excited about that. And uh, it keeps getting better. Template field actions. Another uh, really common use case for code is being able to run an action when the user clicks on a field. You're turning a field into a button, so to speak. And uh, that can be really helpful. You know, Squid has this idea of row actions in tables. Um, but if I've got a field over here and then I have to go search for the action, that's time lost. That's cognitive load. If I see something, I want to be able to take action right there. That's a really just good UX principle. And so what we can do now with template fields, which lets you combine different values and stuff like that, is you can say, when the user clicks on it, I'm going to use the action framework to do a number of different things here. And the example that we've got is a currency field and a template. And when the user clicks it, it uh, uses an action to show a menu. And then when you select an item in that menu, it does a calculation and populates that value. So some really cool uh, possibilities there. 
Um, so those are, are four uh, pretty important features um, related to data entry and display um, that hopefully remove the need for a lot of code um, that you would have used previously around fields. And that's one reason why we feel really comfortable now adding more extensibility features into this latest version of Squid because you know, we, we, you can do so much declaratively before you ever get to that point. But if you do get to that point where you're wanting to do some HTML formatting, that is back now in our, our template fields uh, for everything from address formatting to including um, images and stuff like that. And then if you want to go further, if you need to do something that's really specific, um, that's really powerful, you can use JavaScript and add it. Um, and then call that via what we call a custom field renderer on the field. Um, now, brief note, if you're interested in these extensibility features, the custom field renderers and the, the CSS in the DSS does have to be turned on. That's a feature you have to get turned on. Uh, and that just means you need to reach out to your, your squid rep if that's something that you want. Um, and that's just because we really want to focus on our declarative um, uh, tool set um, because immediately, it, you know, it's easy to jump in and immediately go to that code stuff if that's what your experience is. So uh, you just need to talk to your squid rep if, uh, if that's something that you want in your org, uh, but that is available in the Boston release. Um, yeah, this example over here is a custom field renderer. I just want to shout out Cody Taylor on our product content team. Um, and uh, it was funny because I, I asked for some good examples of custom renderers to show. And a number of the ones that um, uh, folks were talking about can actually be accomplished now without any code, with the, the field highlighting, with field actions. And so it's a good problem to have. So here we've got uh, using emojis in our uh, pick list uh, design strategy. Thank you, Cody, uh, for sending that my way. All right. Um, let me show a few things here related to field controls uh, so you can get a sense of where you're going to go uh, to take advantage of those, those features. Um, this is a page that I've set up. Um, it's, a, it's an opportunity list. And uh, the example I've got is relatively simple. Um, so Squid lets you go pull in related information in line in table. In this case, I've got an opportunity table and I want to see my account address in line right here. Now, the, the way that Squid works, though, is that because that's a related object, I can't edit it in line like I can some of these other things, which are just fields on the opportunity object. So if I see this, I might need to take some action as a user, um, especially if I'm thinking about data quality. Um, being able to take action at this point uh, is going to be really critical. And so I can do that using template field actions. And I can also let the user know that they need to take action with those field variants. So if I go to my design um, system over here, I can go to the, uh, the field component. You can see that I've created a field variant called template action. And it's got uh, some padding. But I've also given it a hover state. And that's important because that signals to the user, hey, this is interactable. Um, and then if, uh, if I need to uh, actually take action on that, um, then I've got a variant that I can apply that has a different color background. Now, we've got Michael Barnes on the line. Uh, Mike, we uh, spent some time talking about the new release. And uh, some of these features um, jumped out to you. Um, and uh, I just wanted to chat with you specifically about those. You talked about conditionally highlighting, I think a case field was one use case. What was yep. it that you were thinking of when you saw this? So yeah, so the first thing that jumped to my mind was, hey, if you have fields, and you've kind of already mentioned it a little bit, but uh, my use case was a, a case that has a status field uh, that has to be updated because the case comes in as a new new case. And the first thing we want our agents to do is you know, maybe update the status so we know that they're looking at that case. So I'll be able to highlight that field so it draws attention to it. Um, and that's true of kind of anywhere you have uh, fields that require action versus fields that are there for information only. So we saw that yeah, this is a great place to, and something I've you know wanted probably since the first time I got into Salesforce is, hey, is there a way to really just draw attention to the fields that require action versus the ones that are just there for information only uh, yeah. or just for reference? Yeah, and then I think you, you mentioned another thing about the uh, the Salesforce Lightning styles for required fields being important. Yeah, 
Yeah, we use uh, we use Lightning Experience in Salesforce, and uh, I wasn't really a big super fan of the way it looks, you know, out of the box in the latest version of Squid uh, prior to Boston, which was having the required in the parentheses. Um, does take up a bit of real estate, um, and uh, can, and also sometimes just is invisible. It's not as it's not as obvious. Uh, as uh, you know, having maybe a, a highlighted asterisk or something. So uh, the ability to be able to customize that, I think is going to be important for us to be able to mirror what uh, we're able to do yeah. uh, with the Lightning experience. That way the experience is the same, no matter if they're on a standard Lightning page uh, uh, or if they're on a squid page that's inside of Lightning. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, you, you don't want to have a jarring experience where you're going back and forth and, and changing different ways that you, you give indicators. Um, cool. Well, let me, let me finish showing this here. So, yeah, so I've got that highlight that, that Michael's talking about, and I've got some HTML actually that shows a different label. It says, hey, no address listed, click to update. And what's cool about this is that um, I've got an action uh, that will open a pop-up for another object, for the account object, where I can then go and um, add some of that information in there. Um, All right, we'll go ahead and save and refresh. And then you can see that the, the, the variant is no longer applied. So for managing data quality, um, giving the user interaction at that point of information, really, really important, really, really exciting. All right, I'm gonna keep us moving. Um, this next section, um, I'm gonna have uh, Rob talk a little bit about what they've been working on related to some of the features uh, in the builder toolbox. Um, Rob, what's coming for experience builders in Squid? Yeah, so really uh, this fits right in with the themes that you've already enunciated, uh, Matt, that our, our primary intention here is just to make it easier for you to build, to take away the places where you had to jump to code, to, and, and therefore you had, a, had a, a challenge to moving to our newest uh, V2 release. Uh, so there's just a couple of things here quickly we want to point out. We've had donut charts for a long time. People love their donut charts, but people wanted to customize what they could show inside the donut chart. And uh, that th there were some uh, internal APIs that were controlling that made it very difficult to do that. And uh, we always, ha we, we, uh, we often basically had to say, no, you can't customize that. So now we basically opened the doors put templates in the inside of those donut charts that respond to the uh, point that you're looking at and they'll let you put HTML in those templates. So in this case, we've got a chart of, uh, you know, the size of planets and we wanted to show the picture of the planet as you, so as you hover around that, uh, that donut chart, you get the right planet in the picture in the middle. So that's kind of contrived, but, uh, yeah. but, but it's just the sort of thing that, you know, Yes, obviously people are going to want to manage or, and manipulate and c customize what they see in the middle of that donut chart. Yeah. So that's a quick thing. So the second thing is very similar. Uh, uh, and yet, uh, so if you wanted to jump forward. Uh, so we've had display logic for a while, you know, the ability to show and hide components or fields or aspects of your page based on the data that you're working with. But it used to be that when you wanted to have the display logic operate on some sort of formulaic comparison, maybe, uh, you know, you compare two fields and if those fields are equal. So in this case, it was, I, I only want to show this warning message if my pay date is further out than two weeks from my uh, due date. You know, that, that kind of comparison, you, you kind of had to tie your arm behind your back and go around the barn and come out the other side of the window in order to get that done. You know, it was like, okay, create a UI model with the formula that does that calculation and then render the condition based on that. Uh, yeah, it was Rube Goldberg. It was definitely Rube Goldberg. Yeah. Uh, and so we've just basically taken out that complexity uh, for the user, for the builder, and just made it a lot easier for the builder. So now you can have formulas be part be evaluated as the content in your display logic uh, conditions. And I'll show you that in a demo here in a second. Cool. Uh, but again, it's just trying to just trying to make it as easy as falling off a log to do these really interesting and complicated. It's, um, it's, it's, imagine coming into a squid page two years on and having to go like, oh, oh yeah, uh, like, this, yeah, it just it, you had to like navigate back through three different places, uh, three different basic areas of the composer to really understand what was happening. 
is very difficult. And we're just trying to make it simple. So then the other, the other theme here uh, is that we're, we're, we're trying to make the, the experience of like actually debugging your squid page, understanding what's going on in your squid page, uh, uh, just more straightforward. So a couple of things uh, on the declarative side, uh, you often set up a sequence of a lot of actions and you, you know, you go to your page and you push that button and you, you hope that all those actions go and you, if you don't get the results that you were thinking you should have gotten, it's hard to understand like where in the action sequence did things break down. And, and you don't want to just delete the action and all its configuration in the builder so to, 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 do, to do testing. So we've given you the ability to, to skip actions, to, to designate in a sequence that you want to skip a few. So maybe you want to you know, actually not execute a query, but you want to set the value of a, of a condition. So skip the query and just set the value, and then you can interrogate that model and see if the, query, the condition was applied appropriately before the query executed, or things like that. Now, be, be careful with this, because this actually turns it off in the XML, and if users are using that page, those actions won't be running for them. So it's really a debugging tool, uh, but, but recognize that it has this impact. The other thing we, we, we have, uh, it's, it's not something that we've done in the product, but something that we've documented more formally and we're rolling out as supported is our debug API. So uh, many of you who have used Squid for a while recognize that debugging Squid often means using the browser console and the developer tools in the browser to really understand what's going on. It's the best way to, to for example, interrogate the data that's being populated in your models. Uh, it, it, uh, so. We ha we've had uh, kind of under the covers internally a debug API, and now we're publishing that and it's available in our documentation. So uh, I've put a screenshot here of, of the page in our documentation that talks about that, but it's the best way to get information about models, components, and then what's really powerful about the debug API is what's called action logging. So if you turn action logging on, what will happen is in your console, in your, in your developer console, you'll get a reference to each action as it executes. And you can do things like hi highlight actions that are taking a long time. You can say, oh, if an action is taking more than say five seconds, 5,000 milliseconds, then give you an alert. So you can start seeing, okay, where are things getting bogged down in my page? And you can understand how to, how to take remediation on it. So squid debug, the debug API, it's a super helpful and important thing. Warning, don't put the debug API in your code. If you're writing code, don't use the debug API as a method of, of uh, uh, interacting with the page. It is solely for debugging your pages in the developer console. We will change the debug API. We will improve it. So don't build your applications on it. Use it for debugging and debugging only. So let me just got to say that. Yeah, and, and brief note because um, Arn Pear uh, posted in the uh, the chat there, um, really good point. So much of this rests on the excellent work done by our product content team. Absolutely. Which they they do fantastic work on our documentation, our release notes. There's so much good stuff out there. And one of the another kind of meta theme of this release is integrating, bringing that great documentation into the product. So some really cool things related to that here. Um, I just yep. want to call out, yeah, keep going, Rob. Yeah, so, yeah just shout out to Josh Cutler, shout out to Cody Taylor, shout out to uh, Casey Arnold, uh, uh, Dave Connors, and others that have been involved in the documentation team. Uh, yeah. So the final thing that I'll talk about is uh, we've made a change to kind of some of the underlying technologies that were, were, were used in Squid. Uh, we had... Uh, so we've changed the code editor that we're using. So whenever you went to XML, the XML view, or you went and you created a snippet, you were using a code editor, and we used a third-party library for that code editor. But we've switched to what the third-party library that we were using, and now we're using the same code editor that is used by the VS, uh, VS Code, Microsoft's uh, VS Code uh, IDE. VS Code has eaten the world. It, it, it feels like every developer in the world is using VS Code for writing their code. And so Squid is now falling in line, doing the same thing and using the same underlying code editor tooling that is used in VS Code. And so that gives you the ability, so all, the, all those keyboard shortcuts are gonna be the same, sort of the general experience is gonna be the same, it'll be very, very familiar. The other thing that, that th this, uh, this third party library allows us to do is it allows us to, to, to do kind of IntelliSense, 
and type ahead, uh, some forward thinking uh, ways of looking at your, at your pages that really give you uh, wonderful explorability. So when you're writing formulas, when you're writing, uh, when you're doing merge syntax, uh, the, we, we give you type ahead features now that let you uh, really, it, it saves you a ton of headache. Uh, I don't know how many times you have fat fingered a model field name in your formula. Yep. And, and then wondered why your page didn't work. Well, you fat fingered the name of a function or the name of a, f of a field or the name of a model. And, and so the, the ability for Squid now is it knows your models, it knows your fields, it knows your functions. And as you type, it'll give you recommendations and you can just quickly uh, build your formulas uh, that way. This is so um, good. It ensures the, the, the quality of what you're building. And Absolutely. It also saves browser tabs. You don't have to have your merge syntax uh, open all the time. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, as much as we like the documentation and as much as all of us depended on that global merge syntax document that everyone always had open, you, you no longer have to do that. Yeah. Uh, so if you'll, if you'll stop sharing that, I'll, I just I want to show a couple of these things working together. And while you're pulling that up, I, I, I do want to say, this is one that, uh, that Mike Barnes and I were geeking out uh, about as we were uh, looking at it. Because um, I hadn't actually used it yet when we were looking at it. We, we, we so, uh, emerged you, need, you need to stop sharing, Matt. Oh, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing there. Anyways, yeah, we were talking about it. We, we built out like a little string. It helped us along the way, which was great. And, um, and then also related to one of the things that you said, Mike, you had said that the display logic, the dynamic display logic of being able to compare values was something that you were interested in. What was the use case you were thinking of there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know, using the a, uh, uh, conditional rendering you know, uh, function, I wanted to be able to compare values. So the value of a field maybe on the record I'm looking at uh, relative to another uh, uh, model that I've, you know, done a lookup against. So being able to compare values directly against each other, that's something I, I've tried to do when I was first very new to Squid. <laughs> I ran into that roadblock. I was like, oh, maybe I can just compare this to that. No, there's no easy way to do that, uh, as you guys were pointing out earlier. So um, love the, that I have that ability now to uh, compare against a formula. And just ha and I'm not a developer, so I'm, I don't have a coding direct background. I, I'm a declarative developer, if you think of it that way. I, I, really good at using all the declarative tools available in Salesforce and Squid. Um, so when it comes to doing this kind of syntax, yeah, I'm always having to go look up what is the, what is the uh, format for, the, for this and uh, uh, be able to just start having a type ahead. I'm, I'm really, really excited about that. That's going to well, be helping me awesome. a lot. Yeah. Now, Rob, you're combining a couple of different features here. What, are, what is yeah, that? So, they, so let, let's just kind of walk this through. So I, well, well, uh, Mike was talking, I was showing some of that type ahead in our code editor. Uh, I was building a formula there. But here, uh, I wanna go back and talk about the dynamic logic first uh, and then bring that into context. Uh, something that I've wanted to do forever is, is really uh, develop uh, navigation that operated dynamically based on uh, what we knew about the user. So we could have, let's say, a, 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 a table that detect that that merged a, si a series of functions and the user. So we got maybe a very limited number of rows in that model that had uh, the user and their allowed functions. And then you could use the dynamic logic to say only show the functions that are relevant to this user. Um, so in this case, we have fruits are our functions, and we have a table where the user and the particular fruit is you know is 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 available. So only show the the fruits that are available to a user. So that should be the only things that show up in the navigation. And so ha so how how do we do that? So we go we go to our dynamic logic uh, statement. Um, and we, uh, again, so now we have this ability to make the, the, the dynamic logic operate based on a formula. So we're, we're saying, okay, we pull in the user ID and that's our sort of the front half of the evaluation criteria. And then we wanna compare it to a formula. And so in this case, the formula is, okay, let's go look up that model, you know, the include and navigation uh, formula or the navig include and navigation model and let's, return the user 
when the fruit value of that row is equal to orange, is equal to the value orange. Uh, and so then that would show the orange navigation element. Uh, so this idea of be, now being able to do conditional rendering based on the results of uh, the, all of the rows in a model, rather than just a single value in a model, that's something you couldn't do at all before. Um, and so now th that, that ability is, is, is super powerful. Um, so let's, um, uh, uh, Zoom is causing me headaches because I lost thing, I'm losing things. Well, one thing that I did want to mention um, related to extensibility, this is something that actually is available for everyone out of the box. You don't have to get it turned on. Um, if you go to your, your JavaScript snippets, we've added a new, we've, we've changed a little bit about the path of, of creating a new JavaScript resource. And uh, one of the options for when you create new, new JavaScript and add it to your page is custom formula. We give you some boilerplate code, yeah. which, um, which will let you do that. And I, I just wanted to mention that because what's cool about that, you're talking about formulas. You can go create a custom formula in your page, and then you can use that custom formula declaratively in yep. your display logic, in model, uh, model formulas, uh, so on and so forth. So some really cool things there. Yeah. yeah. So just, just again, wanted to get in to, uh, to, to the, to the, the formula builder here. Uh, so this was, um, again, what I was messing with before, uh, where, where the, the type ahead really saves me a ton of time. So I want to use the model lookup function. Well, the model lookup function, you know, just when I start typing it, I can tab in and actually accept that that's the one I want. I can get, uh, there's hover states applied now that give me a lot of richness about the detail about what this what this function allows, what the values it's expecting, um, and it really makes it easy. Uh, and then when I uh, start putting uh, you know merge syntax in, it says, okay, do we have a uh, do we have a model in context? If there's a model in context, then we'll start. It'll it'll grab the field values for that model. If there's no model in context, I can. Uh, Let's see, if I start doing the dollar sign, it'll go, okay, well, this is gonna be global merge syntax and here are all the, that, all the options for global merge syntax that I can. Yeah, get. this, is, this so, is one of those things that, you know, it's gonna be really cool as you start to learn it. And then a month on, you're gonna to start to wonder, how did I ever that's right. live without this? Like it's that's right. an extension of, of, of my being, not to get too philosophical. Anyways, yeah, continue. Okay, that looks like I, uh, I, st I, made, I, made, I made changes and, uh, and I borked my page. Uh, let's, let's save this page and let's go back here. Uh, also getting. So while you're doing that, I do want to um, uh, bring uh, Mike back in. Mike, you were um, uh, telling me that you're actually rebuilding some of your pages to take advantage of some of these newer squid capabilities from the yeah, last absolutely. From this one. Yeah, what are some of the features that you're you're finding compelling right now? Yeah, so I'm, uh, you know, I've since the you know one of the more recent versions of Squid, I, I've definitely started rebuilding some pages in V2, you know, in version two. Uh, uh, everybody knows, you know, the, well, actually we're launching one of the, my major rebuilds on Monday, so awesome. we're, I've had a beta team that's been going uh, going forward with that. Uh, but uh, we talked about a couple already. Of course, the dynamic field editor, formula editor, I think that's going to save me just a ton of time and just mm -hmm. my own personal time building these things out and avoiding fat fingering values, which I do all the time. So I completely rec recognize that as a <laughs> challenge. Uh, the field level highlighting, I think I'm, that's something I'm definitely going to be deploying here as I get Boston uh, going. Uh, but one of the things that I've found, and just yesterday it came up, and it's come up uh, just with this rebuild, component level actions are so much more powerful now. So for example, the component action for the wizard component, which this is something that I uh, couldn't do in V1, where I want to open a wizard that I already have built. I'm using the wizard for multiple purposes in this page. So when it comes up in a shows up in a pot inside of a uh, modal, you know, formerly called pop-up, yeah. it uh, uh, I can now navigate to a specific uh, wizard okay. step without exactly with, with the component thing right there. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, and then yesterday, what came up was uh, uh, another thing that I, I I realized was an issue when I was rebuilding the page, but I didn't know what the solution was until I Googled it. And of course, the answer came right up inside of a, a Squid community chat. But that somebody had asked the question actually several years ago. But then, fortunately, somebody had answered the question only uh, several months ago, which was, "Hey, why don't you try using the new component?" Uh, actions. And what the problem was, 
when I, I was using page includes and whenever I, I would do something on one page include, you know, one page that's in, that has a page include, slip, switch to a tab on the master page that would take me to another page include, the information that I had just created in, pay, in you know, page B would not show back up in page A because I started in page A that I already rendered. So I click back to page A, it says, well, yeah, nothing's changed here. So you're seeing the same thing you saw bef what, after, you know, before you clicked to B to begin with. So that said, when I, with, with the component action, I can now on my page include on the master page say, um, whenever this tab is rendered, go ahead and reload that, that page. And I can do that with the component action. There's no code. Previous, the previous solution, which I was starting to try to figure out was, oh, write this little script and then you can you know, call the script. And I don't like to do that. So <laughs> that oh, finding that there was a declarative solution was a huge win for me. Yep. No, that's excellent. Well, um, that is great to hear. Good luck with the launch. Um, and uh, yeah, that's really exciting. Well, Absolutely. we are coming up on end. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we do have a few minutes left. Um, we've had a couple questions in there. I wanted to open it up uh, for some Q&A. Um, and again, if we can't, if we can't get to, to your question, we will, we'd love to follow up uh, afterwards. But uh, questions about the, uh, the Boston release. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so one of the questions, uh, Matt, if you actually want to, if you could jump back into the Design System Studio, uh, one of the questions was, where was the CSS for the bouncy checkbox? So we can just refocus for a second on um, the editor and the custom yes. code portion yep. of that. And yep. then if and anybody wants that code for the bouncy checkbox, we can add that to our uh, GitHub uh, repo where we've got a bunch of fun things like that. We'll share that out. Yep. So in the, in the Design System Studio, um, there is a – you'll see this little um, – Jackson, what is the design term for the three little dots there? Is there a... It's, it's a menu. A, it's just a menu button. Oh, I've heard it called a kebab, going with the... the menu, food. menu buttons can have uh, jokey food names, like kebabs and hamburgers and hot dogs and meatballs. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. So we've got... It's, it's, it's often known as mystery meat because <laughs> you don't always know what's behind it. Anyway. <laughs> Got it. So we've got three meatballs on a kebab right here that you can click on. Um, and that's where you get your option to clone a variant, create a child variant. Uh, and then if you have this feature turned on, you'll have an option to extend with code, which will open up the code editor. And again, you'll have your declarative properties over on the right. Um, over on the left here, you'll see the default um, code with all the CSS attributes there that come with the variant. And then over here where it says custom, you can add your own. And, and customize it. And then the actual code for that, I think Cody put in, uh, in the chat, it's in, their, it's in our docs actually. So I do wanna uh, highlight our awesome docs um, uh, done by our product content team um, that don't just have instructions, but they also have examples. Uh, a lot of really good stuff. Um, so, and in light of that, I do wanna call out a couple resources that are available for you as you get started. Um, with, uh, with Squid Boston, um, and I'll go and pull those up, and I think there may be one or two more questions that we can, we can get to, but I do want to point out we have a Boston landing page uh, that has a ton of content on it. Um, it's got uh, links to go install Boston, in, and again, recommend please install into a sandbox or a dev org before you go to production. Uh, to go uh, check it out. There's a video there, there's release notes, there's documentation, uh, blog posts. Uh, there was the link to register to this webinar. We'll also put a link to the recording, press release, a lot of good information there to go get started. Uh, and then secondly, one uh, really uh, cool resource is that a lot of the stuff that we were showing on our slides comes from a really great page that was built um, by uh, Wen York. Uh, who is on our marketing team and just has some amazing squid chops and design chops. And um, I do want to show that here. It is, it is lovely, uh, but it is up on our sample pages uh, Git uh, repository. Um, and uh, if you go there, you can get the design system and the page. And if you go put this page in your org, this is a squid page here. You can then go through it and see each of a lot of those features that we were looking at. You can see them in action. Um, 
and then you can go get into those in the composer um, if you want to see how they're built. Uh, so that is a great way to go dive into the new release. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Any, anything else that we wanted to answer before um, we finish up today? Yeah. Uh, well, reassure everybody we will get answers to you offline if we're not addressing in the webinar. One question was, is the uh, Monaco editor or the improved code editing that we've seen in the formula builder and elsewhere, is that available for in the V1 composer as well or V2 only? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I think the V1 composer is still ace editor, the old, the old editor that we use. Rob, do you want to confirm that? Um, I don't want to speak without actually looking. So <laughs> I don't want to tell a lie. Yeah. So. Um, the broader, the broader theme and the way that we're, we're treating the two API versions is that, um, you know, API V1 is, is going to be stable. We are not, we don't want to introduce, um, new, new features there. Um, so a lot of the new features, the cool stuff that you're seeing, that's all API V2. Um, and that's typically what you can expect. And so there's, you know, um, that's what you should be thinking about uh, going forward. But yeah, let me just double check. Yeah, I, I, I did just double check while you were uh, talking about that. And it, it is true that the, the V1 uh, pages still use the ACE editor and that will still continue to be the way it moves forward. Yep, sorry yep. about that. Cool, no, thanks. Um, good question. All right. Uh, I think, yeah, there are some other questions, some of them unrelated to things for this release. So we'll answer those offline. Um, say a little bit about, uh, once you get into Boston, excited about this. I think you'll also be excited about some things we've got coming uh, in the next release, which we're planning uh, before the end of the year, um, including bringing the calendar component to API V2 um, and migration assistance as well. Uh, is in the works. And uh, <clears throat> also, if you are interested in uh, continuing with the extensibility theme, uh, we are going to be doing a closed beta for custom components for API v2. So creating custom components um, for v2, if that's something you have a need for and you are interested in, uh, we will have um, we will be doing a closed beta program for that here uh, starting shortly. So again, reach out to us, reach out to your rep, um, let them know you're interested in that with extensibility and, uh, and we'll follow up with you. Excellent. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and finish up. I wanna say thanks again to uh, Jackson, Rob, uh, Mike uh, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And a shout out to our um, product design engineering teams, our product content teams, uh, it's, every release is just a huge effort that requires a ton of teamwork. Um, and it's just a delight to go in and get into some of these new features. So um, please go and uh, try it out today. Uh, check out this page, check out the release, go to the landing page. We really appreciate you, our user community. Uh, and you know what, I'll close with that. If you haven't, go to community.squid.com and uh, please get involved there. A lot of great questions, uh, ideas. Um, we post announcements there. Uh, get on, get active. We'd love to see you there. Thanks so much, everyone. Stay safe, stay well, stay sane. Uh, take care, and we will see you uh, in you know before the end of the year. Bye.